Home prices have probably peaked for the year, though they'll likely stay up around where they're at for a few more weeks and then start slowly trending down all the way through December. Collin County appears to be cooling off early this year, and the market up there has actually been softening for quite some time, and we're going to see that in the data today. Total new housing permits are back to COVID recession levels, and this has been a long time coming with these high rates. They've been trending down for some time, and according to the new census data, that trend is continuing. How the Fed handles the next few months is going to have a huge impact on the affordability of housing for years to come. If they get this wrong, prices are going to go through the roof again, and I'll discuss all of that here in a minute. Mortgage rates remained pretty much exactly at 7% all of last week, and as a result, we saw another increase in the number of people applying for mortgages, though it's a small increase. And remember, we're still working off record lows historically. Overall housing inventory is looking more and more healthy every week, and we've actually got 38% more homes on the market right now than we did this time last year. But new listings are still lagging behind. We're covering all of this and much more in this week's market update. My name is Michael. I'm a real estate agent here in the Dallas area, and every Monday I give you a weekly update covering all of Dallas and Collin counties, as well as the national real estate market. We're looking for trends. We're tracking mortgage rates as well as mortgage purchase applications, as that's our best leading indicator to what demand will look like 30 to 90 days from now. We're looking at things like median list price, days on market, how many homes are having price decreases, what's inventory looking like, and if you stick around until the end, it's my favorite part, the top 10 ranked hottest and coolest cities and zip codes in all of Dallas and Collin counties. If this sounds like something you're into, make sure and hit the subscribe button. And if you're looking to buy or sell in the Dallas area, whether it's next week or next year, I'd love to connect. I've helped every one of these yellow dots find their little piece of Texas, and I'd love to help you too. Just call, text, or shoot me an email. All that info is in the description below. Okay, today is June 25th. Let's see what the data is telling us this week. And if this is an old video, you can click the playlist here, and it'll take you to the latest weekly market update. First up is market news. We got the census building permit numbers last week, and not surprisingly, housing permits are continuing to decline. As long as rates stay this high, builders' confidence declines every single week. And you may not remember this because the last survey was a while ago, but multifamily permits have actually been in a recession since back in September of 2023. You may not remember this because the last survey was a while ago, but multifamily permits, that is things like apartment buildings, have actually been in a recession since back in September of 2023. Because when rates get this high, it does not make any sense. It's too expensive to float a housing building compared to where rents are. So it doesn't make sense to build apartments with rates this high. But now, single family housing is also starting to follow suit. And as I said in the intro, how the Fed handles these next few months is going to have a huge impact on housing affordability moving forward, potentially for years to come. A couple things to consider here. Multifamily units take around 21 months to complete. So even though permits have been declining, the workers building these apartments will still be employed for a long time. Then also, just because something has been permitted doesn't mean it's been started yet. So many builders, both of single family and apartments, have a backlog of permits that they haven't started yet. So just because new building permits are declining, that doesn't mean a market crash is here or instant mass layoffs in the housing construction market because 21 months is still a crazy long time for these people to be employed and things can change drastically in 21 months. Just think even 12 months ago. Honestly, things can change month to month here. So some builders have backlogs. The buildings take crazy long to build. That's the context we're looking at here. So now let's look at the charts. Okay, the first chart here, this is the number in thousands of units of the total housing units. So this is both apartments and single family. And you can see it's been declining for a while. And we're basically right back to the start of the COVID-19 recession. But more importantly, I want to point out Look at what happened here. This is how dependent everything are on rates. Immediately in COVID, people stopped applying for permits entirely. The second that rates dropped to zero, look what happened, straight up. That's the difference that rates make in people wanting to build houses. So again, even if this were to happen again, what would actually happen is the same thing. The Fed would drop rates extremely and it would bounce right back up. Now we're looking at single family permits. You can see the decline is slower here. And I also wanna point out each one of these peaks, this one, this one, this one, this one, these are all in January. So it's normal to see the most amount of permits being applied for in January. That's when they're getting ready to make sure they have enough homes completed for these summer months. And then permits will decline. Permits will decline, they decline. So that's what we're seeing here. It's, it's nothing huge and drastic. This is not a market crash thing. This is literally builders are holding out. They're gonna continue building their backlog and just buying time until rates drop. And this is why, as I've talked about before, a lot of builders right now are restricting their supply. So if they've been selling houses too fast, they actually wanna hold off on selling that supply and they're limiting the number of contracts that they'll accept every month. 
So even if you want to buy a house in one of these communities and you see it listed, they may not let you contract it until next month because they want to hold on to that supply so they don't have to build new stuff while the rates are this high. They want to wait till rates drop, then they want to start building again. So right now, everyone is just buying time. They're slowing down their permits. That's why. Now, why is this so important? Economic cycles have very similar patterns. One is that when the Fed raises rates too much for too long and becomes too restrictive, it leads to housing to go in a recession first. Meaning construction workers, specifically on single family houses, are usually the first to get cut. So if you didn't know, when unemployment starts to jump quickly, it almost always starts with a big layoff of construction workers. So layoffs in the construction industry are actually a good leading indicator historically that a bigger recession is coming. Now, for the last few months, we've actually still been gaining jobs in this sector. But if permits and new housing starts continue to decline without mortgage rates dropping, that puts this labor pool at risk. So here's the balance the Fed has to navigate. If the Fed remains too restrictive, keeping rates higher for longer, and it continues to cause new housing starts to decline, eventually, once they get through that backlog, if there's no new homes to build, it's gonna lead to big layoffs in the construction industry. So on the one hand, that will finally get us the high unemployment numbers that we need for the Fed to drop rates. This is what we talk about every week. But on the other hand, if the labor market gets cut significantly, it means builders have stopped building houses, which is the supply that we need. So when that unemployment goes up because these workers got laid off, rates are going to come down, but there's not new homes being built, then there won't be enough housing supply for the increase in demand from the low rates, which means prices will go through the roof again. Because building houses, as we just discussed, takes a long time. This isn't something you can just turn off and turn right back on. If the labor market gets cut, there's no homes being built, it's going to take a year or more to get that machine turned back on and running at full speed to make enough inventory for the increased demand. And that entire time, those lower rates are going to be bringing bringing more and more buyers into the market. You get it? So it's very important the Fed drops rate even a little to bring back some home builder confidence to keep them building more housing supply without seeing mass layoffs in the construction industry. Otherwise, we're gonna get low supply with high demand. Prices are gonna go crazy. I'm sure everyone knows this. If you want to see housing prices come down, we need more supply. So we need builders to keep on building and keep on building even more than they are currently. In fact, that's the only thing that has kept housing prices from continuing to skyrocket these last few years. Okay, moving on. Let's start with national housing inventory. Okay, looking at the chart, this week we had a nice increase of 13,593 homes available for sale in the U.S., which gets us up to 634,132 homes available for sale in the country. For reference, the all-time inventory bottom in 2022, we had 240,000 homes for sale. The peak of last year, we had 570,000 homes for sale. And the same week in 2015, we had about 1.18 million homes for sale. So we're up more than double from the absolute bottom, but we still need to nearly double again to get back to a normal market. But we're getting closer every single week, and right now we have 38% more homes than we did last year. So inventory is definitely growing. That's been the one big positive this year. Okay, now we're looking at new listings in the country, and you can see for most of the year, at the beginning of the year, we started tracking with 2022. It was looking very promising. And then right here in May, we basically just split the difference, and we've been slightly above last year and quite a bit below 2022. And this week we actually had 11,669 fewer homes listed than the corresponding week in 2022. And one important thing to note here that I'm gonna start saying every week is that there's only a few more weeks before we see the seasonal decline in new listings. So I'd say probably three or four more weeks before less and less homes get listed every week, which means you're going to have less and less new options to choose from. People get confused by this every year because they see, well, inventory can continue up throughout the year, but new listings are dropping. So if inventory is increasing, that means those are the homes you already saw that you don't want. Every single week, you actually have less and less new options to choose from. So if a month from now, you don't like the homes on the market, you're gonna have less potential options every single week. So don't wait. The next few weeks are gonna be your biggest chance of seeing the most new houses to choose from. Okay, now we're looking at pending sales. Again, this is still national data. We have 2.5% more single family homes under contract than we did a year ago. We have 396,000 homes currently under contract in the country. And you can see we've just been slightly above 2022. 
which the thing that's very interesting to me is we had way more people applying for mortgages last year, yet we're having more sales this year. Then the last thing we cover nationally is the percentage of homes having price decreases. Every year it's normal for a third of homes to take a price cut before selling. And looking at the national chart here, this week we have 36.9% of homes taking a price cut. Last year we got as high as 39.2%. The year before we got as high as 43.2, so just know it's normal for this number to be going up through November. We'll see how high it gets this year, but we're just tracking to see aggressive swings in either direction, and we're not gonna see that unless there's a big change in mortgage rates one way or the other. It's gonna probably remain pretty steady. If rates were to drop, I would expect this to drop sharply. If rates were to go up, this would absolutely go up sharply, but for the most part, that's all we're looking at. Are things getting weird or are they normal? And so far, they're still normal. Okay, moving on to mortgage rates. We started last week at a 7.04, and we really just hung out right above 7% even yesterday, which was Monday, since I'm making today's video on a Tuesday. I cannot remember the last time that things stayed this stable. It's almost a little scary. It's almost too quiet here. We're just gonna stay at 7% now. But the big story here was, and we've been tracking this the whole time, this is the 10 year, this is what mortgage rates follow. So we broke this uptrend, we retested it, we came down and we broke this line was very significant. You can see the treasury market thinks that this line is very important. We broke below it, we've been holding below it. We've been holding in a very tight range. And if I had to guess, if I had to guess, I'm not the Oracle, I would say we're gonna take one more shot at this line and then we're gonna come down to this line. That's my guess of what happens next. But as of now, this is definitely still trending down. So we broke the uptrend, we've been trending down, we'll see how low we get by the end of the year. Now, looking at mortgage purchase applications, this week we saw a 2% increase in the number of people applying for mortgages, which gets us almost to about as high as we've been all year. Well, outside of the beginning of the year when rates dropped. But we've been in this range, just up and down or right back to the top of this range. So this is basically the highest demand we've seen since March. So obviously people are enjoying rates being back near 7% instead of above 7%. And again, there is no reason to believe mortgage demand is gonna grow significantly with rates right at 7%. But as I said earlier, we have more pending contracts, but look how many fewer people we have applying for mortgages than we did a year ago. And I always feel like I need to give a disclaimer. You have to understand this is national data. Here in the Dallas-Fort Worth market, we're the number one fastest growing market in the entire country. So our market looks different than this, which is why Dallas, the city, has actually seen a 21.2% increase in housing prices over the last year as of May. Okay, that's the national market. Before we move on to the local markets, if you are considering buying a home here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area this year, two things. One, if you wanna make sure you don't go broke buying a house, I have made a course specifically for you which includes a new and improved version of my max affordability calculator. With this tool, you're actually gonna input your own personal spending habits straight from your bank account, and it's gonna show you with 100% accuracy how much house you actually can afford. It takes into account everything all the way down to your income tax bracket. It's better than anything I've ever seen online, and I promise you it is a really helpful tool. And then two, if you just wanna master the home buying process here in Texas, if it seems scary, it seems overwhelming, I've made two courses, one for new construction, one for resale homes, because they're very different experiences. So if you just wanna get fully educated before you even step into the market, the links for all of those courses are down in the description. Okay, now let's move on to the local markets. We are starting with the MLS data here in Dallas County. In Dallas County, in the last week, we had 592 listings. That's 17 more than last week. 330 closings. That's 56 more closings than last week. Of the homes that closed, 94 were immediate sales, meaning they contracted within the first week. That's 23 more than last week. 337 went under contract. That's three more than last week. In total, there are 2,329 homes either under contract or in pending status. That's eight more than last week. So we definitely saw an increase in activity here in Dallas County. Now looking at Collin County, we had 418 listings. That's 46 less than last week. 276 closings, that's 28 less than last week. 68 were immediate sales. That's 14 less than last week. 203 went under contract, that's three less than last week. In total, there are 1,927 homes under contract or in pending status. That's nine more than last week. So you can start to see the difference. Dallas seems to be having more activity and Collin County seems to be slowing down even on the weekly data. So now let's check out the market action index. If you're not familiar, it just takes all of this data here, puts it into one easy to read graphic with a number. Anything at 30 or below is a buyer's market. Anything above 30, we're asking how much of a seller's market are we in? So we really just look at this 
to get a quick overview. Are things looking normal or are they looking weird? They're still looking normal here in Dallas County. As we've been discussing, we should be at the top of housing prices. They may stay here for a few more weeks and then they'll start to decline, but we don't expect prices to go up anymore from here on out. We can see the market action index has been slowly declining since May. That's normal. We're going to cool off from here on through the rest of the year. We're still a slight seller's advantage. The number of homes having price decreases is increasing. Inventory though is still just slowly increasing, but increasing nonetheless. So that's what it looks like. A totally normal slight seller's advantage. At this point in the year, everything looks normal. So let's look at Collin County. Collin County, remember on the MLS data, we saw they had a slightly slower week, but they are all the way down to a 40. So they're quite a bit slower than Dallas, whereas at the beginning of the year, they were actually hotter. And we can see their market action index has been cooling off just quicker. We can see it in the median list price. Now, I don't rely on any one week data ever. What we look for is a trend, but this week you can see we had another drop as well as the median price of new listings. We're gonna have to wait a few more weeks to see what's really happening with prices, but we already do expect that they should have topped out for the year, so it's normal that they'll come down. We just have to see the speed at which they come down. But interestingly enough, their median days on market actually had a drop, and I think that might be due to the price decrease. I don't know, again, we're, we're only looking for trends, so. Take this all with a grain of salt. Number of homes having price decreases, a little above where Dallas is, 44, 45. That's normal for these places this time of year. Inventory also slowly grinding up, but you can definitely see Collin County is cooling off much quicker than Dallas County is this year. And something new I'll be covering moving forward is the pending sales data. So I wanted to show you actually the difference between Dallas County and Collin County. Dallas County pending sales weekly, you can see the last three years have been in a pretty tight range. So the black line is this year. You can see for a little bit, we got above the previous two years. Now we're right back in the middle. So Dallas County for the last three years has been having about the same amount of pending sales every week. We are just barely above where we were last year. We had 1854 last year and we're at 1904 this week. So almost the same. But there's a huge difference when we look at Collin County. You see the black line in Collin County, how it's way above the previous two years. That's because What's been selling these last few years more than anything? It's been new construction. That's why it's so important that these builders continue building houses because that's the only thing that's kept prices from going through the roof. People who were looking in Dallas, it became unaffordable with these high rates. So what did they do? They moved out to the suburbs in Collin County where they could get a four, five, six percent rate and a house that costs a little bit less. And all they have to do is commute 30 minutes in. So looking at it this week, this year, we have 1,630 homes pending in Collin County, whereas last year we only had 1,180. So way more homes pending now than we had last year. That's just because there is a ton of new construction there. And this is also why Collin County is probably cooling off faster than Dallas County because builders are building a ton of supply. So anytime the market slows down at all, you've got way more supply over there. What causes price drops? If you have more supply than you have demand. And that's all we're seeing there. Builders are building a ton of supply. So as soon as demand cools off, the prices drop quicker than in an area like Dallas where we don't have new construction like that. Okay, I feel like I'm rambling, so I'm gonna move on now. We're looking at the market action index, that same number. Remember 30 or below is a buyer's market, but we are just ranking the top 10 hottest and coolest cities and zip codes in all of Dallas and Collin counties. Okay, starting with the absolute hottest city in all of Dallas and Collin County, number one is Carrollton, Texas. That heats up one spot and Louisville cools off one. So those two switch spots in the top two this week. Then Coppell, Grapevine, Lancaster, Plano, Richardson, and Garland all remained in their exact same spots. And then Balch Spring heats up one, Grand Prairie jumps onto the list out of nowhere, and Ferris, Texas gets knocked off from number nine off the hottest cities list. Then we like to zoom in on the hottest zip codes. The absolute hottest is Carrollton 75010, then Carrollton 75007, Louisville 75067, Plano 75025, Coppell 75019, Plano 75075, Garland 75042, Richardson 75080, Plano 75093, Grapevine 76051. So if you live in any of those zip codes, congratulations, you can sell for top dollar. Now we're looking at the same thing, but the coolest cities and zip codes. The absolute coolest remains and has been for a long time, Van Alstine. And something interesting this week, for the first time, we have a second buyer's market. Van Alstine has been a buyer's market that's below a 30. Leonard finally becomes a buyer's market. So we have two official buyer's markets 
city-wise in Dallas and Collin County now. But those two remain in the two coolest spots, followed by Prosper, which cooled off one. And this, again, is reflective of Collin County. Prosper is a big part of Collin County. It's been on the coolest cities list for a while and is continuing to drop. It's nearly a buyer's market in Prosper. And then Levon cools off one. Nevada cools off one. Sunnyvale cools off three this week. Salina heats up to, that's Collin County, it's a little cheaper than Prosper. Then Rockwall heats up one spot, Royce City cools off one, Blue Ridge heats up two spots to take the hottest city on the coolest cities list, which again is only a 35.57. Now looking at the coolest zip codes, the absolute coolest, Van Alstine 75495, Leonard 75452, Irving 75038, Mesquite 75181, Dallas 75219, Dallas 75204, Prosper 75078, Levon 75166, Dallas 75205, and Nevada 75173. Remember, if you're looking to buy or sell in the Dallas area, whether it's next week or next year, just call, text, or shoot me an email. I'd love to connect. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.